You're listening to A Scary State, and this week we're covering Colorado. So Nora, yes Lauren, let's get scary. Hi everyone, today's a great day. Um, Why Nora? A lot went right today. You know you have those days where it just feels like everything goes right? That was today for me, so, and yeah, it's just awesome. We're going to California in a week. Woohoo! We're flying together. Um, so by the time this comes out, I think we will have been yeah, back. Yeah, we'll be back by the time this comes out. That's Dang. insane, man. Oh, But hopefully we'll have a seat next to each other. Oh, I hope um, so. I'm not a big fan of flying. I'm not either. Usually I just close my eyes and like hold Ian's hand, but I'll just do that to you if we're next to each other. <laughs> Sounds good to me. All right. So today we are covering Colorado. Mm-hmm. And you know what's funny? I was thinking about this as I was researching this, but I feel like everyone outside of Colorado pronounces it Colorado, and people in Colorado pronounce it Colorado. Huh. Have you ever noticed that? Nope. Is it just me? All right. Well, <laughs> if you're from that state, tell us how you pronounce it, because those t- types of things really fascinate me. Oh, have you ever taken that quiz? It's online. It's – I can't remember who it's through, but it's um ha- where you're from based on how you talk. So you take a test based on the words you say, and it point like pinpoints you where in the United States you're from. Yeah, like it's like kind of like the slang, like what yeah. slang you say. Yeah. So for Joe, my fiance, he's from Boston, and mm-hmm. it pinpointed him right in like city that he grew up in. Mine said I was right from Northern Virginia, so it's really cool. Oh my gosh, yeah, and I mean, it's interesting because like I mean, I feel like I always bring up morbid. But they use some words that they use in yes. Boston and they got a lot of heat for it. So it's yes. like, okay, people, like, remember, things mean different things. Read the context. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, I just thought that was interesting because Joe, like, is Like, from there. okay, those circles that you drive around in traffic, what do you call that? A roundabout. Okay, see, I call it a traffic circle and Joe calls it a rotary. Ro- rotary? I'm sorry, are we – that sounds like a rodeo. Or a phone. Yeah, that's true. So – Boston. Boston. All right, Nora. <laughs> We're talking so much crap and he's standing right there. <laughs> Stay scary, people. <laughs> All right, Nora, tell us about Colorado. Okay, so Colorado is nicknamed the Centennial State and it joined the Union on August 1st, 1876 and became the 38th state in the U.S. The state joined the Union when the U.S. was celebrating its centennial, which is how it got its nickname. Hmm. Colorado's name comes from the word for colored red. In the Spanish language, which is interesting because rojo, oh, Colorado, like rojo is red in Spanish? Yeah. Okay. (laughs) If you say it like slurred. We're similar. Yeah. We're we're getting there. Okay. So weird laws. Dandelions are not allowed to grow within city limits. Our city would be out of law. Literally, yeah. Everywhere. Mm -hmm. You may not mutilate a rock in a state park. Which just sounds weird. It does. (laughs) In Alamosa, it is illegal to keep a house where unmarried people are allowed to have sex. My first thought for this was like an Airbnb or something. I don't know. That one was kind of a weird one. So I was like, I need to include this. That's so interesting. Colorado has 42 state parks, which is not surprising. Mm -mm. Um, And I know I told – I just have to say real quick, I told Lauren this, but there is a great podcast called – Oh my gosh, and now I'm forgetting the name. Park Predators. It's called Park Predators. It's by um, Audio Chuck, and <coughs> it's all the state park, like, um, people missing, murders. It's so good. It's by Delia D'Ambra. But yeah, so Colorado has 42 state parks. The Stanley Hotel, located in Estes Park, was the inspiration for Stephen King's Overlook Hotel in The Shining. I love that movie. Me too. It's such a classic. I went to Colorado for training for one of my jobs, which was the coolest two weeks ever, oh. but we were torn between going to the Stanley or going hiking. We went hiking, but it's on my list to go there. You know what? I feel like hiking, you kind of have to do that. Sorry, Lauren's dog's drinking. We got some noisy guys in this house today. So yeah, I would love to, I mean, I would definitely pick that oh, going yeah. hiking. 100%. But I wasn't with anyone who was like creepy, so we went oh. hiking, but the hike was beautiful. Yeah. So I was, I was happy we did that Yeah, one. that's good. And Manitow Springs, on October 28th, you can watch the annual Emma Crawford Coffin Race and Parade. Yes, you heard that right. Coffin races. This race pays homage to Emma Crawford, whose coffin actually slid down the side of Red Mountain. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. I know. 
The parade consists of the coffin race, where people dress up, decorate a coffin, then race other people in their coffins. That is so... The pictures are actually really, really cool. Really? Yeah. So there's a costume contest and a parade and a lot of food and drinks. You know, that's actually like a pretty expensive competition because coffins are very expensive. They may like might make their own or have them donated or something. Yeah, that's I don't true. know. But the, the pictures are really cool. Nice. Colorado also has the Gates of Hell near Riverdale Road in Thornton. Speaking of, nicknamed the Devil's Highway, Route 666 runs right through Colorado. In 2003, it was renamed as Route 491 to dispel the fears that surround this number. This road still has an inexplic- inexplicably high accident rate, even though the name of it was changed. In Colorado, there have been two identified serial killers. Mm-hmm. All right, so <clears throat> as we said, there are 42 state parks located in Colorado. And so I am going to go over some disappearances in one of these state parks. So in episode, I think it's four, our New York episode, I went over disappearances in the Adirondacks. And so now I'm going to go over disappearances in the Rocky Mountain National Park. So I don't know what it is about disappearances in the woods or forests, but I just think they're so fascinating and so terrifying that covering them is just, I love it. So I I want to research it and I want to talk about it. So that's what I'm going to (laughs) do. All right, so the Rocky Mountain National Park is located about 76 miles from the Denver International Airport and is situated between Estes Park and Grand Lake. This park is a very popular tourist destination, with over 4.5 million visitors in 2018 alone. It's actually one of the most visited parks in the national park system, which encompasses 423 national parks, and in 2015, it was ranked as the third most popular and visited park. So it's so large that there are five visitor centers located at different locations. And this park is huge. It covers 265,461 acres of federal land and 253,059 acres of U.S. Forest Forest Service Wilderness. So it's divided into five different regions, and the regions are really weird. So one is the Moose and Big Meadows. One is the Alpine region, Wilderness, which takes up 250,000 acres of the park, Heart of the Park, and Waterfall and Backcountry region. Ooh, I like that. Backcountry. Well, waterfall. Yeah, I like waterfalls too. <laughs> that country is a place at our old oh, college that was a place that you would go on Thursday nights and it was just a place. Oh, goodness. <laughs> I try to forget it. <laughs> so the Rocky Mountain National Park is defined as having a subarctic climate with cooler summers and precipitation that goes year round. So subarctic is defined as a climate characterized by long, very cold winters and short, cool summers. So it is one of the national Hyatt. It is one of the highest national parks with elevations ranging between 7,860 feet to 14,259 feet. And the park has 77 mountain peaks that all go over 12,000 feet. So the first case I'm going to talk about occurred in 1933. On August 15, 1933, Joseph Halpern, a 22-year-old graduate student from Chicago, parked his Ford sedan at the base of the Bear Lake Trailhead. So this hiking path is one of the most popular in the whole park. He and his friend, Sam Garrick, were going to hike up to Flat Top Mountain. Sam Garrick was Joseph's best friend, Isidore's brother. So Isidore hadn't been able to go on the trip, so Sam had been writing him letters, telling him all that they were doing, what they were seeing, what, like where they were going, just kind of outlining the trip for him. So the two boys were actually traveling with Joseph's parents at the time, Solomon and Fanny. Such an old, older <laughs> name. Um, they were taking a road trip from Chicago through South Dakota, and I guess just taking in the sights... You know, kind of just doing a road trip. Did Fanny bring his pack with him? <sighs> I love it. Sorry. So, so the two boys, Sam and Joseph, reached Flat Top Mountain a little before 2.30 p.m. that day. Joe was really into nature and wanted to continue hiking to Taylor Peak, but Sam was done for the day. So the two decided to split up at that point and each do their own thing, which is never a good idea. Yeah. But they had the plan to meet back at Bear Lake Trailhead when they were done. So Sam finished up and arrived back at Bear Lake Trailhead around 6.30 p.m. to wait for Joseph. Well, three hours go by and Joseph never shows up. So Sam went to find a ranger and report that his friend hadn't returned. A search begins at 10 p.m. Searchlights were brought out to the area and the area was just scoured, completely searched. Mm. At the time, Joe had only been wearing a blue and white striped shirt, khaki pants, and heavy boots. All he had with him was a small backpack that he had filled with sandwiches, fruit, and a motorist's guide to the park. So clearly not things that you're going to use if you're going to be out for a while. Mm -hmm. 
So the weather during this time had been nice and manageable during the day, but at night, rain and windstorms hit and temperatures dropped down to the 40s. Six days passed with no signs of Joe. Sam, who had still been writing to his brother, had to send the heartbreaking note to his brother that said, quote, I've got some tragic news. Joe Halpern disappeared in the mountains last Tuesday and nothing has been heard of him since. He continued on to say, quote, The last couple of days have been miserable out here with a deadly gloom prevailing. Miss Halpern cries all night long, end quote, which was oh, so sad. Yeah. So Edmund Rogers, the park superintendent, surmised that Joe had been hiking late in the day into night and had been caught in the dark. He believed that Joe tried to descend Taylor Peak, got lost, and fell into a crevice somewhere. So the search was officially called off six days later on August 21st, 1933. The Halperns and Sam left that day and returned back to Chicago. So understandably, the Halperns, Joe's parents, asked Sam if they could take a look at the letters that he had been sending back and forth to his brother Isidore, who also went by the name of Ed. Um, and so let's take a look at what was included in those letters that Sam was sending. Oh so Sam said that Joe had been saying that he was tired of school and worried about money. He had dreams of being a sailor or, quote, transient. I don't think that's a good word anymore, but that's what they used in the document. Mm -hmm. um, so his parents had clung to the belief that he was just unhappy in his life and was looking for a new life. So fast forward a little bit, Isidore, or Ed, received a letter from Solomon, Joe's father, on October 1934 that said, quote, Dear Ed, Joe is alive, or at least it is highly probable he is. Okay. Yep. So in 1934, the Halpins were having a friend visiting. The friend didn't know about Joe and his disappearance, but when he spotted a picture of Joe in the Halpins' home, he told them that he had seen Joe in the winter of 1933 outside of a restaurant in Phoenix begging for a meal. So I believe this may have been why Solomon sent this weird letter to Ed about believing that Joe was still alive. Mm -hmm. So immediately, Joe's parents got in touch with the restaurant owner in Phoenix and sent a photo of Joe to the owner. The owner passed the photo on to the local police, who brought it to a local, quote, transient camp, and showed the photo to the men there. To their surprise, the men had, in fact, seen Joe there a couple of months earlier, but, huh. he, had been, but he had been going by a different name, though they didn't mention the name anywhere. Here's where I need to introduce Roland. So Roland is the son of Joe's brother, Bernard. Mm -hmm. So he is Joe's nephew. So Bernard had died in 1998, never knowing what happened to his brother. This prompted Roland to begin looking back into the disappearance of his uncle Joe, who he never got to meet. Mm -hmm. There isn't a ton on what he found. Most of what he found led to dead ends or included information that was already well known. But he did find something interesting that only brought about more questions than answers. So Roland had found a letter dated to 1936 from a man named Sam Greenfield to the FBI. Greenfield claimed in this letter that in 1935, that in 1935, Joe had been working for the Lewis Brothers Circus under the alias of Lewis Hollenbuck. Huh. Yeah. So Roland looked into all the different claims, searched this name, searched the company. But even with all of this information, it all led to dead ends. Mm. So even though we have this awesome piece of information, just nothing came from the it. The record keeping probably wasn't great, mm -hmm. especially with like circus yeah. stuff. So Roland concluded, though, that he truly believes that Joseph never left the park that day and that he passed away in the mountains. So Joe mm -hmm. isn't the first or only person who has disappeared in the Rocky Mountain National Park, which brings me to my next case. So this is the disappearance of Alfred Bellhart. Bealhertz. Bealhertz? Mm -hmm. A four-year-old mm -hmm. Alfred Edwin Bealhertz. Four? four no. Disappeared near Estes Park in the Rocky Mountain National Park on July 3rd, 1938. Alfred was one of ten, so he had ten other, or nine other siblings. Wow. So the Bellhurts family and some friends decided to go camping and hiking in the National Park for the 4th of July weekend. They set up camp about a quarter of a mile west of the Fall River Lodge, which was near the Lawn Lake Trailhead. Their campsite was also located near where the Rolling and Fall Rivers meet at a point just below Horseshoe Falls. So their first night was uneventful, and in the morning, Alfred and his father William decided to walk together to a nearby stream to wash up. Two of the friends they were camping with, Oren Bronson and Walter Hansen, were also washing up about 500 feet upstream from William and Alfred. Mm -hmm. So William and Alfred finished first, and as William headed back to camp, Alfred decided to go meet up with Oren and Walter, mm -hmm. and he was going to walk back to camp with them when they were finished. So William returned to camp shortly after, followed by Oren and Walter, but Alfred was nowhere to be found. He had disappeared within the 500 feet between his father and the two other men. Immediately, a search began. Mm -hmm. Over a dozen people joined in to search for him right away. Without immediately finding him, though, the family decided to call the park service, and they contacted Ranger MoMA at the Fall River Ranger Station. MoMA immediately contacted the CCC, which is the Civilian Conservation Corps. Within 45 minutes, over 100 members from the CCC arrived to begin the search. Wow. So the next day, which was July 4th, 
bloodhounds from the Colorado State Prison were brought in to help in the search, but they were unable to even find his scent. Mm. The rangers were already starting to believe that Alfred may have drowned after falling into the Roaring River, so they built a dam and diverted the river on July 5th. So the river was searched, but nothing was found. So the rangers decided that they would erect a wire net. So it's pretty much just a huge, heavy net that if anything goes through, it'll be caught, Mm -hmm. which is kind of... So they did that near the Fall River and hoped that they would find some evidence that way, but again, nothing turned up. So Alfred's family, though, believed that he had been abducted and told the rangers this. They said that Alfred wouldn't just walk away, and they had their doubts that he had fallen into the river. So July 6th rolled around, and the search of the river had ended. Searches of the land continued, and by July 7th, over 200 searchers had ended up telling news reporters that they didn't believe that Alfred had drowned. They were convinced he either got lost in the woods or he, had been, or he was abducted. So the search lasted for 10 days, but was later called off when they could find nothing. Mm-hmm. So there were some weird sightings during these 10 days of searching, though. Mm-hmm. So July 3rd, the day that Alfred went missing, William Ells and his wife had been hiking in the National Park on the old Fall River Road. After some time, they got tired and decided to take a break around 1 p.m. Alfred had already been missing at this point because he went missing earlier in the morning. As they were resting, they were looking around, and they ended up looking over at Mount Chapin. They weren't prepared to see a young boy sitting on a rock in the section of the mountainside known as the Devil's Nest. Uh (laughs) So the Devil's Nest was about six miles from where Alfred had disappeared. So the elves stated that they saw this young boy make a shrill noise walk to and look over the ledge, then either leave or get pulled from the ledge. So the elves then decided to hike to where they saw the young boy to see if he was hurt or needed help. Mm -hmm. But when they reached the devil's nest, no one was there. So they decided they should alert someone. And the details for this part get a little, I don't know. So they decided they should alert someone. And upon returning to their car, they heard the news report of missing Alfred. So I don't know how the news had already started reporting him on the day he went missing, but maybe it was the next day. Mm -hmm. They eventually arrived home and saw a newspaper article with a photo of Alfred that confirmed that they had, in fact, seen Alfred at Devil's Nest. So they immediately notified the rangers. The rangers, though, were at first skeptical that they had even seen Alfred, considering where he was, how far from the camp it was. But they did send a group of about 150 men to search the area and found nothing. On July 8th, the FBI had found a soiled bandage in an abandoned cabin in the park and announced that they would be performing a forensics test on it. I literally could not find anything about this. I could not find the results. All the articles I found just said that they found this, but no results. I feel like for that time, they, I don't know. It was back in the 30s. So, I mean, yeah, almost, oh my God, almost 100 years ago. So this announcement of the findings had come after the insistence of Alfred's parents, as they had been certain he had been abducted, and they thought this would kind of be that clue. Mm -hmm. Um, This is because Alfred had had a blister on his foot that day, and his mom had wrapped the blister with a very similar material to what the soiled bandage was. So that same day, a woman named C.A. Lynch had been driving from Big Spring, Nebraska, where she lived, to... Oogalala, Nebraska. (laughs) No, I butchered that. I apologize. (laughs) Um, And when she was driving, she saw a mysterious man walking with a little boy along the highway. So obviously, she didn't think anything of it at the time until she was looking at the newspaper the next morning and saw the photo of Alfred. She knew that the little boy she had seen walking on the highway the previous day had been him. Wow. So she told her brother-in-law, W.B. Lynch, and two days later, W.B. went and told Fred Renovati, the Denver detective sergeant of his sister-in-law's sightings. But again, couldn't find anything about what came of his sighting, nothing. So four months later, on July 27th, 1938, Alfred's father, William, received a ransom note. The ransom note oh. said, quote, Sorry for your son. We went west, out of money. The boy doesn't take to us. We will return your son if you leave $500, which is $9,193 in today's money, in a can one block from your house and the note. We will return your son within 24 hours. That is so sick because you know 99% chance it's someone who heard about it and they're trying to take advantage of this family who's like probably freaking out and not in the right state of mind, you know? Well, by November 29th, two days later, the police were able to confirm that this ransom note had been a hoax. Oh. Yep. So they issued a statement um, that they had investigated two possible suspects who had left this note. The suspects weren't named and they weren't formally charged, so there was nothing about them. So the three main theories that it's believed of this case are that one, Alfred drowned. Though many believe this just isn't the case. They searched Mm -hmm. the river, nothing came up. They just don't think this is a possible option. Mm -hmm. They also believe that maybe Alfred had been abducted. That's Mm -hmm. what the family's going off of. 
or that foul play had occurred. Had Alfred been killed accidentally while camping somehow? Had the family tried to cover it up? No one knows and no one will know. So still to this day, nothing has been found about Alfred. Avi, I don't know any of the facts of this except for what you just said, but for some reason my gut told me that, like, he was probably – I. the thing is, if he was only 500 feet away, he could scream if he was abducted mm-hmm. or scream if he was lost, and they would be able to probably That's hear a good him. point. So I'm like, maybe because he did wander off a bit, and then he was um, abducted, like, so that it was from outside of hearing range. Mm-hmm. It's just so crazy. And, like, little kids are so trusting, too. So if someone had just been like, mm-hmm. oh, hey, you want to go, you know, hi, yeah, new friend, so you want to go see something? I mean, yeah. it's not surprising to think that maybe, you know, a little kid's going to be trusting and follow this person. Mm-hmm. And four is so young. Uh-huh. I mean, you can only teach stranger danger so early. Yeah. But, like, your brain just isn't ready yet to understand that. Because you think all adults are, like, you know, trustworthy and yeah. safe people. Mm-hmm. So that brings me to my third case. This is kind of has a controversial part in it that I wasn't sure if I wanted to include, but I did. Okay, good. And if you get offended, just remember, we're just reading things that we see. Yes, yes. We're <laughs> not... Is not us deciding. <laughs> yes. So I wasn't going to include it at first, but then later in the story, you'll see why it had to be included. Mm-hmm. So this is a story of Bobby Bizup. He was only 10 years old when he went missing in the summer of 1958. So Bobby was attending camp at St. Malo Retreat. <laughs> was attending <laughs> camp at St. Malo Retreat, which was a Catholic camping retreat located in the Rocky Mountain National Park. So Camp St. Malo would open for six weeks in the summer, from late June to August, and boys ages 19 to 16 were welcome. Usually there would be about 75 to 90 boys overall who would attend. So it was a week-long camp where the boys would arrive on Sunday afternoon and leave the following Sunday morning. They would play games, play outside, go fishing, do all the campy stuff, but also Mm -hmm. spend time worshiping because it's a church camp. So in 1959, the camp only charged $30 for a week. (laughs) Now, I that's like an hour that you're paying for camp. Yeah, an hour of daycare. (laughs) I was a camp counselor for two years. You were? I was. um, I didn't know that. Yeah. (laughs) I have stories from that, too. I actually... I loved it because I love kids. Yeah. And my coworkers were really, really cool. And so we would just like joke around with each other all the time and have these little kids. But oh my gosh, one time we were in the cafeteria. It's towards the end of the day and a freaking spider made its way in. I don't do spiders. And it was a wolf spider. So it's big. Oh, those are really common in Virginia. Yeah. So all the kids were like, oh my God, Miss Lauren, come look at the spider. And I said, absolutely not. <laughs> so I run to the other side of the cafeteria. So I two of the camp counselor guys came in. I was like, go kill the spider. And they said, "Uh uh-uh. They ran over to the other side of the cafeteria. Oh, my god! So we have all these kids near it. We're like, come to us. Don't go near the spider. I don't know how he killed it because I know I didn't touch it. Because they're gross and they're big and they're hairy and they run at you. No, no. So (laughs) back to this. So a little about Bobby. He was introverted, partially deaf, and had a hard time being understood when he spoke, so he relied heavily on sign language. He also loved to fish. So he was pretty much a regular at the camp. He had attended three times the previous summer and was already on his second week this summer. Okay, so let me pause here to bring up what I found while researching. In 2019, an agreement had been made between the Colorado Attorney General, the Archdiocese, am I pronouncing that right? Diocese? Diocese. The Archdiocese of Denver, the Diocese of Colorado Springs, and the Diocese of Pueblo that gave a former U.S. attorney the authority to look into seven decades of church records and publicly expose priests who had been accused, credibly, of sexually abusing children. So the report details 43 Colorado priests who had molested at least 166 children between 1950 and 2019. So this report found that the camp's founder, Bazzetti, a prominent figure in the Archdiocese of Denver, had reportedly sexually abused a teenage boy in 1949 and 1950. So this report went on to find that there was sexual abuse at Camp St. Malo in the 1950s and 60s. Oh. Mm-hmm. So two priests were exposed as having participated in the sexual abuse. Two priests who had been counselors at the camp for years. One was Father Harold Robert White, known as, quote, the most prolific known clergy child sex abuser in Colorado history, a man with at least 63 victims. The other was Father Neil Hewitt, who had abused a minimum of eight children. They had both been serving as counselors in 1958, the year that Bobby went missing. 
So on Friday, August 15th, the last week the camp was open for the summer, Bobby decided to do some fishing at a spot called Cabin Creek. He, since he was pretty much a regular at the camp, he knew the area. He wasn't alone while fishing. There was a counselor nearby, and the creek was a popular spot for the boys to go swimming. So it was a, you know, well-used place. It was around 6 p.m. when the counselor who had been at the creek, Terry Cohen, and Bobby decided to head back to the main part of the camp for dinner. Cohen stated that he had looked at Bobby and pointed to his wrist and then back in the direction of the camp, signaling that it was time to head back because Bobby was partially deaf. Mm -hmm. Bobby nodded his understanding, and they both began to head back. Bobby was walking just behind Cohen, and when he turned back to check on Bobby, he realized that he was gone. Cohen had originally thought that Bobby was playing a prank on him and was hiding and was going to jump out and scare him, so he started to call out to him, but there was no sign of Bobby. More counselors came to continue searching, but nothing was found. An intense search of the woods around the camp began, operated by the Archdiocese Mm -hmm. of Denver. That sparked a nine-day search that included close to 500 police officers, volunteers, other volunteers from the Colorado Civil Air Patrol, and airmen from Denver's Lowry Air Force Base, where Bobby's father was actually stationed. His father was a master sergeant there. So aircrafts were used to check from the sky, tracker dogs were used on the ground, skin divers, which sounds really gross, but they're just like divers, were used to search the heavier ponds. They even brought in an Indian tracker, their quotes, um, but they never found even a trace of Bobby. That poor child. Mm -hmm. So the search was extensive. It extended up Mount Meeker to about 11,000 feet, four miles in each direction, but still nothing. So during this time, there were again some weird sightings. A doctor had been vacationing in Estes Park about 15 miles from the camp. 15 miles! Mm -hmm. And claimed that he had seen Bobby walking around the streets in the city part of Estes. It Vi- didn't help him? Like, if you Well, seen- he just he just saw a little kid oh, walking around. He, it wasn't like walking around lost. He was just Mm-mm. like walking. Yep, just okay. a kid walking. And okay. it's like a city where families are vacationing. And I we drove through this when I went to go hike in Colorado. Mm-hmm. And it's just like a cute little vacation town. So if you okay. see a kid walking, you're really not going to think anything of it. Yeah. So the sighting was immediately considered not reliable as there was no way that Bobby could have gotten so far so quickly. Or could he? Mm -hmm. Hmm. Workers at a hardware store also claimed to have seen a boy in the store that matched Bobby's description, down to the hearing aid that he wore. They said that they had tried to ask the boy questions, but he failed to respond and only pointed at his ears and mouth, but quickly left the store. So again, they're not thinking much of it. Yeah. These sightings were dispelled, though, when a man called the police. He said that he had been vacationing in Estes Park and that his son looked similar to Bobby and even had a hearing aid. So that must have been who everyone had seen walking around and seen at the store. Uh, So it sounds suspicious at first, but then when you read it, you're like, oh, you know. So that's unfortunate. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know. So almost a year later, in June of 1959, torn clothing, a broken hearing aid, and some bone fragments were found in a remote area, 2,500 feet up Mount Meeker. So that's 11,000 feet, like, in elevation, Mm -hmm. by three counselors who are about three miles from where Bobby went missing. So this mountain's over here where he went missing was three miles away from it at the creek. Mm -hmm. Mount Meeker is known as, quote, one of the most majestic mountains in all of Colorado, it's also the second highest summit in the park and is considered to be a pretty difficult climb. Um, the bone fragments, unfortunately, turned out to be Bobby's. But it's only oh. bone fragments, so it's not even a lot. It's just bone fragments. And this is very odd because, like I said, this area was already extensively searched in the original yeah, search a year ago. They put it there after. Well, you, yeah, you don't know how it got there. Um, it was also a very, it wasn't a very easy place to reach, let alone for a 10 year old boy on his own to get there. So nothing else of Bobby's has been found. So it was just the clothed bits, his hearing aid and bone fragments. So no wow. other part of him has been found. One weird thing though, those counselors didn't report their finding of the bone fragments for three days. It's like they knew something. Which is sketchy. You it find is, bone yeah. fragments and you're going to wait three days to report Especially it. Especially when you know that someone from your camp was missing. Went missing. Like you would call right away. Mm-hmm. So Boulder's coroner was able to conclude that Bobby's cause of death was, quote, probably from exha- exhaustion and exposure, which is really sad. That is so sad. So Larry Collins, who had been part of the team to investigate the remains, didn't believe that Bobby was lost. Like they don't, he doesn't believe that Bobby just randomly got lost. Mm-hmm. He is quoted saying, quote, As you look up at that mountain, you could look back and see the camp. He could always tell where he was. Now, if he was lost, he would have been lost in the trees. But once he got above tree line, he could look back in and see the church. You could see the camp. 
I believe he was well acquainted with the area, and I doubt seriously that would that he would have gotten lost. I think he knew exactly where he was, end quote. Yeah, and I think um, people might be quick to assume, like, oh, because he was deaf, he easily could have, like, gotten disoriented. But people who have, like, if they're deaf or blind or whatever the case is, their senses are heightened mm-hmm. in other places. It's not like they, they're they not ever self-sufficient. Yeah. Like, He's, if he went there regularly, he sh- he would have known. Yes, that's what most of the articles said too. They're like, he's been here multiple times. He knows this area. He knows the hiking trails. He knows where he was. Yeah. Sorry, my dog is seeing another dog outside. She cries by the window sometimes if you hear noises. <laughs> Um, so it was later revealed by many of the campers that Bobby had appeared to be very angry and upset on the day he went missing. Um, so I'll get to that in a little bit. But his parents ended up burying him at the Fort Logan National Cemetery. And the part that broke my heart is that his father is buried next to him. Oh, that just, oh, that got me. So in 2019, Neil Hewitt, one of the, um, counselor priests I mentioned, Mm -hmm. was interviewed by Nine Wants to Know. So Nine is like the station that they have over in Colorado. So Nine (laughs) Wants to Know is one of their segments. Okay. So Neil stated that he had an interaction with Bobby shortly before he went missing. He had been running the snack bar at the camp, and Bobby came over wanting more candy. He would told Bobby that he had had too many sweets and didn't think he should have any more. So he said that after that, Bobby took off running, like was just upset and took off running. So it's curious that he didn't reveal the story during the time of the initial investigation back in 1958. Yeah, and that's very different than him being fishing and getting called in for dinner mm-hmm. or whatever. So he was one of the last people to see Bobby. And... Get this? He was one of the three counselors who found Bobby's remains one year later. Conveniently, he's the last one to see him, one of the last ones to see him, and one of the three people to find his bone fragments on a random remote part of a mountain. He just happened to come across Mm -hmm. them. Hmm. Yep. That's interesting. So with Colin's... Yeah. So with Colin's quote about Bobby being able to see camp from where he was and others saying that he looked angry and upset that day, many have speculated that Bobby was trying to run and hide from something. So he wasn't getting lost. He was running from something. So it's believed that he was upset and took off. He maybe then got lost or mixed up, but ultimately died from exposure. Aww. But it's still weird because there's not much, not much was found from him, just his fragments and the hearing aid and stuff. So what's even more bizarre, though, is the Archdiocese was interviewed years later about the disappearance of Bobby, but they kept literally zero records or reports of his disappearance. So you would think Mm -hmm. if you have a camp where you have children, you would have some record of this kid disappearing. Right. They have nothing. Or, like, anything, like, accounts of Mm -hmm. the last people to, like, anything. Nothing. That's insane. Mm -hmm. So that's all we know about Bobby. Oh, I know. It's really sad. It's really sad. Um, so just a couple other people who have gone missing in the Rocky Mountain National Park. In 1983, a 27-year-old man named Ruddy Motter had been winter mountaineering. So it was like a solo backpack ski trip in the Box Canyon slash Thunder Pass area and went missing. The only thing found was his food pack. A similar case occurred in October 1949. Um, a similar case to Joseph's. Mm-hmm. Two men, Bruce Gerling and David DeVitt, two students from Colorado A&M, age 20 and 21, had been hiking on the North Inlet Trail when they went missing after being separated from their group. They were also found near Flat Top Mountain, where Joseph and Sam had been hiking. So during the search for these men, the weather had deteriorated rapidly and high winds came. The winds were so strong that they blew down thousands of trees and ultimately blocked the trails that the searchers were going on. No trace of them has been found. Wow. Earlier in 1940, a skull was found near Peacock Pool. It was believed that it had been that of a man who had been hiking in Chasm Lake in 1921 and went missing. In 1933, a 22-year-old man was last seen hiking towards Andrews Glacier, never to be seen again. So Joe Evans, a retired chief ranger in the park, wrote a book in 2009 titled Death, Despair, and Second Chances in the Rocky Mountain National Park. Super creepy. Yeah. So he is quoted in the book as saying, quote, It's a vast area, and you have to work your way off the plateau at some point. And boy, if you get off trail, there are some difficult canyons and lots of places for people to, quote-unquote, disappear and never be found. Mm. End quote. So he literally says, quote-unquote, disappear and never be found. So that's real real nice. So the Coloradoan, it's like a newspaper, I probably pronounced that wrong, (laughs) provided some hiking tips. So if you're one of our active listeners, here's some hiking tips. When choosing a route, know your limits. Be truthful to yourself and don't overestimate your abilities or that of the group. Mm -hmm. 
Complete a detailed trip plan, including details of what trails you'll be taking, your contact information, when you plan to arrive and return, and names of everyone in the group. Leave this with a trusted friend or family member who is not going on the trip with you and leave some sort of identification in your vehicle, which that's always what happens is people go missing and no one knows where they went because they didn't tell anyone. Mm -hmm. Develop an emergency plan for what to do if you or your hiking companions become lost or injured. Have a way to communicate. Bring your cell phone, but do not rely on it solely because of the risk of limited or no coverage and reception. Consider taking along a personal locator beacon. If you are using your cell phone, keep the battery fully charged. Searching for a cell signal can quickly drain your battery. Um, so consider turning off your phone or switching it to airplane mode. Be weather ready. So check the weather before you head out. Keep checking conditions as you are able to while on your hike. Mm -hmm. Weather can and often does change rapidly in the mountainous parks in Rocky Mountain National Park. So that is my case. Can we type up those tips and give them to our friend Mai? Or from Mai. Because I think she needs them. We <laughs> talked about her hiking adventure <laughs> when we did New York. I thought, oh my God, that's all I could think about when I was reading this. I was like, uh, Mai, you got so close. I know. The whole phone about to die. I'm like, yeah, oh. that's totally, <laughs> that hits close to home. <laughs> oh, man. All right, so what are you going to tell us about? Okay, so I've literally been thinking about this story all day because it's just too much. It's so much. Okay. So the the story starts off in Indiana, but the crimes happen in Colorado. Okay. So I just – but when I read about it, I was like, I want to tell this story. I think it's so funny when we do a case where, like, I can justify this because yeah. most of it happened in this one the state. The actual <laughs> crimes, the scary part happened in Colorado. <laughs> and I think, you know, sometimes – I think it's important to, like, look at the positives in things. So, you know, when you're when you're listening to this case, you can know that you will never be worse at relationships than the woman in this case, Jill Billiot. She is the worst person at relationships. You try to top her, I don't think anyone could. She sucks. All right, let's get okay. to it. Okay, so Jill Lanita Billiot was born somewhere around June 11th, 1943 or 1944 in Louisiana. No one knows for certain of the year because Jill was an absolute compulsive liar and told people different birth dates and the record keeping just wasn't great. Good. Um, Off to a strong start. Exactly. Jill had a very typical middle-class American childhood. Her father was named Henry Billiot, and he was a tugboat captain, which is someone who drives small boats and helps larger boats steer into tight spaces on a dock. By the way, don't look up what a tugboat captain is on Urban Dictionary. <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> I Googled what it was. <laughs> Why would you think of all the places to look up a definition, Urban Dictionary no, it came was the up. place? It came oh, up it came as a up. suggestion. It did. Don't Google it. <laughs> <laughs> so Jill's mother, Juanita Engelman Billiot, was from northern Indiana and served as a full-time stay-at-home mother to Jill and Jill's brother, Mark Billiot. Jill's family was middle class, like I said, um, and during her sophomore year of high school, Jill moved in with her mat maternal grandparents. She was described as pretty and smart and fit in easily at school. She had brown hair and brown eyes, and actually I looked up a photo of her and call me crazy, but I feel like she looks like a less attractive version of Winona Ryder, like way less attractive. Oh, one when you put up your Instagram post, yeah. mention that so we can have well, our listeners look see. look at her. Like, oh, yeah, am I see. absolutely crazy, or does she kind of look like Winona Ryder? No, you're not crazy at all. <laughs> Do you see it? Yes. Like, a way uglier version. It, Yeah, like, they could be sisters. Yeah. Like, she got the bad genes. Oh, my gosh. I know I sound really harsh with her, but I just really don't like her. Okay, so we don't like her. We do not like oh, okay. her. Okay, okay, good. Yeah. So, pretty quickly after starting school, she met a man named Larry Innan. They quickly fell in love, and, drilled, and Jill dropped out of high school and married Larry in 1961. Oh, I hate when women do that. I know. Like, ne I all the things that, like, hurt me are when people are like, oh, I'm just going to drop out of school. Like, we'll focus on their education. No. Mm. Put yourself first. Exactly. Get it done. Because you know what? You need to be self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. um, I know then was a different time, obviously. But yeah. Well, nowadays. Yeah. And also, like, Larry graduated. So, like, Jill, you should have just graduated. Yes. Come on. Oh. And it's high school. I mean, I know it was the 60s, but still. But still. So they were both only about 17 years old um, when they got married. Then less than nine months later, Jerry moved back in with his mom, and Jill filed for divorce and got a restraining order against him. 
The divorce was finalized less than a year after they got married, and in 1962, divorces were granted to one of the two people in the marriage because base, it's, like, based on who needed the divorce at that time. So they're, like, it's, like, oh, well, this person was right, so they deserve the divorce. That's so weird. That's how it was done back then, which is so crazy because it's so subjective. So there's none of those just, like, you know. Irreconcilable mute. differences or yes, whatever. That's, yeah. Yeah. No, at this time it was like, okay, who was right? Who deserves it? And That's so weird. Yeah, and in this case, Larry was granted the divorce on his grounds of cruel and inhumane treatment by Jill. Wow. Okay, Jill. And this was just the beginning of his insanity. So after her and Larry divorced, Jill went back and got her high school diploma and enrolled in Northwestern State University in Louisiana. Okay. And that's where she met husband number two, Stephen Moore. Oh, Stephen. Similar to her and Larry, they started dating casually and quickly fell in love and got married in 1964. And just like with Larry, the relationship started turning sour by their first anniversary and shortly after the birth of their child. Oh, no. So she pretty much got pregnant right away in Mm -hmm. the marriage and then they got divorced. So in in 1965, they separated. So she has one kid now. Mm -hmm. Soon after that, she met William Coit Jr., a wealthy gas pipeline worker who was never in one place for very long. His career made him travel and move around all the time. He was out one night having a drink in the French Quarter of Louisiana, where lo and behold, he met Jill. Louis or North what? (laughs) New Orleans is a one of the places that I am dying to go you've mentioned that and i'm I so want down to go so yeah. badly i wanted to go there for my bachelorette party mm-hmm. but with covid and everything i was like this is might be like a once in a lifetime kind of trip yeah i don't want that to be ruined because of anything covid i don't want any mm-hmm. restrictions so we have something else super fun planned but yeah it's my i want to go so bad just mm-hmm. the history all the creepy spooky things that are down there like oh Wait, you don't know where we're going right I know where we're going. Oh, okay. I don't know anything else. Okay. All right. Yeah. So I like I, surprises. Yeah, definitely. I will say that's a good idea to not do that for your bachelorette right now because um, Bourbon Street is very crowded. Even though it's mm-hmm. outside, it's like yeah. you're packed in and it's yeah. wild. People are like all over the place. So yeah, it's... I'd rather have the full experience when we can all be safe and have a good time and not worry about it. Exactly. And where you can like actually go inside to all mm-hmm. of Because it's very historic there. Oh, there. Oh, my gosh. There's just like Lollery. Yeah. All, just all of those types of stories. Mm-hmm. Like the really like kind of scary ones. And then just all the history there and all the locations. I just mm-hmm. want to do it all. Yeah. All the haunted places mm-hmm. there. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That evening that he met Jill, William felt madly in love with her. What is about this woman? Okay, honestly, like, I don't know. I do not know. Like she had a really great personality. Apparently, but it was, like, turned on and off, as you'll see. Mm -hmm. He considered giving up his crazy, busy job to settle down and have a family after that one night with her. Wow. She's, like, hypnotizing. Mm -hmm. There was one problem, though. Jill was only separated from her second husband, Stephen, and they weren't officially divorced. So Jill got to moving and officially filed for divorce in 1965 and moved in with William. Less than a year later, in January of 1966, Jill and William got married. So this is husband number three. Jeez. And she is like 20. And I don't even have a husband yet. Well, you know (laughs) what? You're farther along than I am. (laughs) Ian. Ian. (laughs) Unfortunately for William, Jill failed to tell him that her divorce from her second husband hadn't been finalized yet, but it was finalized two months later in March of 1966. Isn't that like illegal? It is very illegal. Mm -hmm. Jill kept this information to herself and pretty sure Jill got pregnant on her wedding night because nine months into her marriage with William, she gave birth to her second son. Where is her first son? It's – I think the son is still with her. Like, okay. she's taking these children with her to these different marriages. Okay. Um, But definitely not stable for them. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I – people get remarried. Things happen, but you'll see why later. Yeah. Suddenly, Jill was able to live a life of absolute luxury, but she started running around with other men. In 1972, so five years into her marriage with William, the relationship was practically over. That's sad. It is. She would actually brag to him about her sexcapades with other men. Oh my god! The damage of her actions 
absolutely destroyed their relationship, and William realized that she was only with him for his money. So Jill actually ended up filing for divorce, and right afterwards, William withdrew a huge amount of money from his bank accounts because he was like, obviously, this woman is trying to get to all my money. Good for him. He joked with his friends that, quote, it was a little bit of money Jill couldn't get her hands on, end quote. That's so sad. Yeah. But 21 days after Jill filed for divorce, William's body was discovered, (gasps) and the money William withdrew was nowhere to be found. Oh, no. And he, like, probably didn't tell any of his friends where he could have put it or anything? No, because I think he, like, just wanted to hide it. And I think it oh. happened, like, you know, pretty quickly. He could have told them, but he didn't. Oh, they didn't no. know. Homicide detectives knew right away that Jill was responsible for William's death, but they mm-hmm. had to gather all the evidence mm-hmm. and everything first so they could have a strong case. But before they could arrest Jill, she fled the area. They tracked her down and she committed herself to a mental facility due to, quote, emotional distress. Oh. Because of that, (laughs) investigators couldn't question her about the case, so it went cold and she inherited all of his estate. So if she wouldn't inherit it, though, wouldn't they be able to, like, follow the paper trail to, like, it going to her? Is that a thing? You, what do you like for the estate? So like, yeah, like they couldn't find her, right? So it went cold, but mm-hmm. she inherited all of the money. Mm-hmm. Well, wouldn't she have had to have that in a bank or like a wire yeah. transfer or something? I don't know. It's like they just they didn't have enough evidence. So once she got out of the mental facility, she just kind of got to keep it all. Oh, it's like they kind of man. gave up on it or something. But yeah, it seems like why did they just give up if they mm-hmm. were so confident that she did it? Yeah, it could just be one of those things that just falls through the cracks. Yeah. About a year and a half after William died, Jill went to California where she met a wealthy retiree in his 90s. She didn't marry him, but he did die a year later and Jill received a huge part of his estate. And I will say the guy was old and investigators did not suspect any foul play because they think he died of natural causes because he was so old. But I mean, it's obvious that she preyed on him due to his age Mm -hmm. um, and he clearly couldn't make decisions very well. Yeah. So moving on to husband number four, this one was a U.S. Marine Corps major named Donald Brody, but Donald was somewhat old-fashioned, didn't let Jill handle any of the finances in the home, which obviously caused a huge issue. That is an old-timey thing. Yeah, Where the man handled all the money, the mm-hmm. woman didn't handle it at all. So my grandma yeah. being the amazing person she is, she's like, make sure you also handle everything oh, with the yeah. money, be up to date on everything. I was like, yeah, grandma. It's so important. Like, it is. It is. Like, say, God forbid, something happens to your spouse. You need to know what you're dealing with. Yeah. Like, my other grandma had a lot of stuff she had to deal with when my Pepe died. Mm-hmm. And so she just – because she didn't deal with any of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's hard when you're older because it's, like, not a thing to get involved when mm-hmm. you're, like, back in that time. Yep. So they separated because she couldn't get a hold of any of the money while they were married. <sighs> and so she she had to leave the marriage empty-handed. Oh, no. But she came up – I know, right? She came up with a scheme to get money out of him in their marriage when in 1974 she told him she delivered a son named Thaddeus. But Donald wasn't naive and definitely caught on to her more quickly than her past three husbands did. Mm -hmm. And later it was discovered that Jill would pay people to borrow their baby for a few hours and try to convince her husband that they had a baby together and that he needed to pay child support for for them getting divorced what like first of all who would rent out their child right and second of all what get a job woman oh my god so then you know the scam luckily didn't work because this guy was like yeah duh (laughs) yeah so then she moved on to husband number five Oh my gosh. This is true. This is crazy. <laughs> this is true. I read this and I was like, who has the time for this? Like, Oh my God. gosh. So husband number five was actually the attorney she hired to fight extradition attempts after she fled and checked herself into the mental hospital. So he's the guy like advising her, this is how you can legally get out of this. Oh my God. So clearly not a great person either. No. His name was Louis DeRosa. And Louis, um, I have a question if you're listening. Are you crazy? <laughs> Like, you knew she was probably involved with the husband's ex mur- or ex-husband's murder and that she had been married multiple times, multiple, and not mentally there. I just – I don't get it. But they got married in 1976, and it was a very volatile marriage that quickly oh, ended. These poor men. Like, it's like she's she, clearly the common denominator for all of the bad things. Yep, definitely. So next up is wonderful number six, Edlyn Metzger. 
She was still married to the lawyer at this point, but she traveled to Haiti to file for divorce, and it becomes finalized at the end of 1978. Wait, I'm sorry. Why did she go to Haiti? Exactly. How does that make sense for, like, U.S. Exactly. laws? It was not a legitimate divorce. It was not yeah. recognized in the U.S. Yeah. For some reason, like, I don't know what she was thinking. I don't know what her thought process was, but she thought it would be a great idea. Why Haiti of all places, first of Did all? Did we have a different relationship with them in the 70s? I don't know history. I know it was, like, um, a French colony, and it's, like, half of where the Dominican Republic is, but that's literally all I know about Haiti. Huh. And I think... It's a poor country, so I don't know if maybe she was trying to take advantage, and I don't know what she was thinking, but this is now the second time she's not gotten a full divorce, and it's just crazy. So is she still married to the first person who she didn't get the divorce from? Eventually, yes. It, it oh went God. through two months. It went through two months after she married the next guy. Jeez. So this time, the divorce, like, it's not legitimate, but... Eventually, she does end up getting divorced to the second the second time. That was not much oh, at wow. first. Yeah. So moving on to number seven. Oh my God. So remember, <laughs> she isn't legally divorced from the lawyer Lewis because it was filed in Haiti, but she gets married again this time to Carl Steely in 1983. The marriage lasts nine years. Wow, Jill. Wow. Wow. I didn't know you had it in you. <laughs> Making moves here. And um, they were married for seven of those years and dated for two years before that. Wow. Okay. And if that wasn't her seventh marriage, that might seem normal, <laughs> um, but it was. Yeah. So later on, when Carl, a.k.a. husband number seven, is being interviewed, he says he feels lucky to be alive and feels like on at least two occasions she had tried to kill him. <gasps> One time by poisoning his coffee and another time by having a man try to run him over while he was <gasps> riding his bike. Oh, my God. Jill claims this isn't true, but – okay, whatever. Okay, Shut yeah. up, Jill. <laughs> so this is when Jill makes her way to Colorado. Towards the end of their marriage, Carl and Jill vacationed in Steamboat Springs, Colorado, and they absolutely loved it. Jill is only 40 at this time, but I think Carl was looking for a place more so to retire since Mm -hmm. he was probably the only one working. Um, But they decided they wanted to retire there, and Jill wanted to purchase a bed and breakfast in Steamboat Springs. So they agreed to purchase the bed and breakfast, but instead of listing Carl on the deed, Jill put only her and her oldest (gasps) son's name on it. Oh, she's so sneaky. So literally using Carl's money to buy this. And just completely cutting him out of it. She and he had no idea that she would, that she did this. Oh, poor man. Um. So when he joined her in Steamboat Springs, he helped with renovating the bed and breakfast, thinking it was half of his. Obviously, like mm-hmm. he's thinking it's something that they own. Mm-hmm. And Jill was squeezing every ounce of handyman she could get out of him. Of course. Before she, um, bef- like while she could, but meanwhile she she was searching for husband number eight. What is with this woman? (laughs) So, Jerry Boggs was one of the wealthiest bachelors in Steamboat Springs, Colorado. Mm. He went to the University of Colorado and was a Vietnam veteran who owned a hardware store in town. He was very into his hobbies. Yeah, just a hardworking guy and he was making good money from that. Um, He was very into his hobbies and improving himself and often spent his free time scuba diving, underwater photography, and flying planes. Oh my god, he sounds like the coolest guy. I I really, he was my favorite out of all of them. Not that I knew any, but. (laughs) Now Jill was used to getting men to swoon over her right away, no matter, like, if she was married or whatever. But Jerry was a little different. She had to work hard to get his attention, and he also had no idea, obviously, that she was still married to Carl. Yeah. Because but that's not typically a question you ask right away. You like, just kind of assume. Oh, hi. Are you married? Exactly. Um, but her love spell worked, and they got married in 1991 when Jill was 41. Almost right away, Jill got pregnant. Jill told Jerry that she wanted to go home to Louisiana to have the baby, so that's what she did. But a few weeks after the child was born, she announced to Jerry that something devastating had happened. Oh, no. What happened? The baby had mysteriously died shortly after she gave birth. Convenient. Now, Which under- would be horrific if that actually happened yeah it's jill though like come on jill um so understandably jill received a ton of sympathy from people in steamboat springs for the most part but not from jerry so every time that she gives birth do people ever like did she ever look pregnant that's okay i literally wrote that in here okay like 
Okay, so he he didn't, first of all, he didn't believe her, so thank goodness. Mm -hmm. But he found it, he did some investigating and found that she was already married, so he rushed and sought an annulment to their marriage, which was granted, since it wasn't legitimate. Good. And then shortly after that, Jill divorced Carl, the guy she was with for nine years. And so I was like, did she never see, did he never see her belly? Exactly. Like, did they never, like, did they not live together? Like, I'm sorry, but when you're married to someone, you're going to know that. Yeah. I just thought that was really weird. Like, not trying to, like, victim blame, but, like, come on, Jerry. Yeah. How could you not know? I mean, there could have been some reason why. Maybe she, like, never wanted to be but naked in front of him. Maybe. But it just seems so strange. But good old Jill didn't waste any time being single. Right when her divorce with Carl was finalized, so remember, she married and separated from Jerry while she was still married to Carl. (laughs) So when her divorce with Carl was final finalized, she started, quote, getting busy with the telephone line repairman. Get it? Getting busy. (laughs) I can't claim that um, joke. It was in an article I read, and it was so good. Oh, my gosh. I had to say it. But... um, I bet the I bet the relationship was off the hook. <laughs> I'm done. How okay. are you today? I think that's our I record, know. Nora. These are just amazing. I love you. <laughs> Thanks. Love you too. But remember, Steamboat Springs, Colorado isn't a huge place. So word of her antics started traveling and Honestly, it's crazy that word didn't travel faster about she was what she was up to. Especially during this time. Like, there's better communication at this time. Exactly. People are talking a lot. Like, everyone knows everything, especially in a small town. Mm-hmm. So it's insane that she got away with this, of what she did in Colorado or in Steamboat Springs. Yeah. Um, so when Jill realized that people were catching on to her, she fled to Colorado from Colorado to Vegas where she met and married Roy Carroll, a.k.a. AKA hubby number nine. This guy was a retired U.S. Navy petty officer, but they split less than a year later. Oh, my gosh. So let's look at her marriage with Jerry again. He was the guy, you know, who owned the hardware store. And Jerry was number what? He was number seven. Okay. And Jerry is the one who Jill, like, was like, oh, the baby died. And mm-hmm. he's like, you're a liar. Mm-hmm. Um, Jerry was known as being a creature of habit. He opened his store at 10 a.m. every day, walked to this place called The Shack beforehand, which was a diner just a few doors down from his store we ha- where he had the exact same breakfast every day oh, of eggs, seems, toast, and hash browns. He seems like such a sweet guy. <laughs> Literally, like, she's like a pre- – she preys on these people. He um, seems like such your innocent, sweet, like oh, – Hardworking. That's, like, that's the hardware man. I know. Um, And then Jerry would skip lunch, um, and every evening he would eat out for dinner at a local restaurant. So he was very predictable. You knew where to find him, and if he stopped showing up to one of his daily routine activities... Something happens to this man! Yeah. Nora! Yeah. People noticed right away. So on the morning of October 22nd, 1933, when Jerry didn't open his store at 10 a.m., it set off alarm bells to many people. One of the people was his older brother, Doug... Doug went to Jerry's house to see where he was, and he was panicking at this point. Yeah. He discovered a gruesome scene at Jerry's house. Jerry lay dead in his home, and it was apparent he had been shot and beaten. Investigators later determined that Jerry had been stunned with a stun gun, shot with a twenty-two caliber gun, and beaten with a shovel. Oh, my God. Police also noticed that Jill and Jerry's telephone answering machine. Remember those? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my gosh, yes. Well, they had recorded threats made by Jill towards (gasps) him on them. Oh. Then police discovered that the two were only a week away from a hearing in their civil case for their divorce. How convenient. Um, Or, no, sorry. Like, they were – I think they were divorced already, but Jerry – because, yeah, their marriage got annulled, but Jerry was pressing charges over on Jill for, like – completely lying about the baby it was a civil case oh my gosh um so right away jill was a number one suspect when police yeah. questioned jill yeah she claimed that she was camping in the kelly flats area of the Pordray canyon in fort collins colorado at the time of jerry's murder that's where we stayed for our uh, work trip really fort collins yeah that's so cool um so she told detectives that jerry was a closeted homosexual <gasps> and that they should look into his gay lover as a potential murder suspect Oh, my God. This woman is horrible. Horrible. And they heard this story, and they were like, there 
she there's no evidence that that's remotely true mm-hmm. like what and so then jill fled again this time because then, that doesn't make you look guilty at all i know and this time she went to mexico city <sighs> gosh but soon she ran out of money and returned to colorado um she was away for a few months before then and while she was in while she was away from colorado and new mexico like hiding out police were building an extremely strong case against her thank goodness they discovered that Jill had been asking people to kill Jerry because he she was telling people that he was molesting her daughter from a previous marriage. There was no There's evidence no daughter. of that. Is there a daughter? I don't I did not see anything about a daughter. Maybe she did have a daughter that just didn't make it into my research I was doing, but I only saw that she had a few sons. Wow. So she offered a friend and coworker seventy five hundred dollars to murder Jerry and told the friend that he made Jill have sex with the other guy while he watched. Turns out Jerry had actually started seeing all of the lies that Jill created and was, and was threatening to take her to court for causing emotional distress, like yeah. I said. And so um, that is what people think was the motivation for Jill to kill him. Dang. So remember Jill's <clears throat> oldest son that I mentioned that she had like right after one of her really early marriages? Mm-hmm. Um, so his name is Seth and it's the one who she put – she put his name on the deed of the bed and breakfast instead of her yeah. husband. Well, he realized that his mom was like absolutely crazy. And he realized that his mom was probably definitely killed William Coit, who had died 20 years earlier. Wow. So he finally spoke up and he told investigators that his mother had told him she planned to kill Jerry. And mind you, he was like a little kid when this happened. Um, well, he was like, you know, younger. Yeah. And that night he claims that his mom called him and said, Hey baby, it's over and it's messy. Oh my god. It's so creepy that she the way she talks. But um, the strength and courage he had though to talk to the cops about this. Is awesome, yeah. So finally, on December twenty third, nineteen ninety three, when Jill was about fifty years old, her and her little boyfriend, the telephone guy Michael Backus, were arrested and held on a five million dollar bond. Whoa. Jill is eventually charged with first-degree murder and and conspiracy to commit the murder of Jerry Boggs. She was sentenced on the luckiest day of the year, St. Patrick's Day. (laughs) After she was sentenced, Jerry's older brother said in an interview, quote, she picked with the wrong town, she picked with the wrong man, and she picked with the wrong family. Yeah. But being locked up did not stop thirsty Jill from striking. Oh, my God. In May of 1988, Jill recruited a friend to place an online ad for her, which was like old school Tinder (laughs) for youngsters listening. Um, The ad said, quote, want U.S. citizenship? Marry an inmate. She's trying to go for number 11 or 10, whatever it is. Crazy. Is that even legal to do? Absolutely not. Oh. The Colorado Department of Corrections found the ad and had it removed and actually had the entire website shut down. Wow. So then on October 22nd, 2002, Jill appealed her case to the people of Colorado with an online editorial. In the editorial, she called for an investigation into abuse and human rights violations against her while she was in prison. I know. Eye biggest, roll. biggest eye roll ever. She, she claimed she had been denied use of her therapeutic braces for her back and both hands when she used which she used to help with her arthritis. Mm. She also alleged that she was sexually abused and had her finger broken by a guard. But knowing Jill, like, I'm never to victim blame, but knowing her, she probably broke her own finger. I mean, you never (sighs) know. Honestly, with her and with jails. and I know. You never, yeah. Yeah. Okay. On (laughs) April 7th, 2006, Jill filed another suit against the Colorado Department of Corrections where she accused several officers of sexually harassing her, which there was no proof of either. Mm -hmm. Because of the horrible reputation that she had in the prison, and I'm sure there was, like, concern that she would be treated poorly by the guard now that she, she, like, made those accusations that weren't necessarily true. Like, they were never proven. Um, She was moved to a different prison under a different name. Oh. So there's rumors that she's currently locked up at a prison in Omaha, Nebraska. There's also rumors that she might be in a prison in Florida, but no one knows for sure because she goes by a different name and has, from what we know, just has like a low profile now. Mm-hmm. Um, and Which must as, be really hard for her. I know, right? 
As of 2006, all of Jill's appeal opportunities had been exhausted, and she even legally cannot sell her story to be made into movies or books. God. I know, because, you know, this would be, like, an insane movie. It would have I to be, like, 10 hours. I think it's, it might be the Son of Sam law. I could be wrong, but there was this law that happened where it used to be that back then, if you were, like, a serial killer or whatever, sorry, I have cough drop in. Oh, you're good. And you sell your books and stuff, you would make the money for that. Mm-hmm. And then it became a law where you're in jail. You can't make money off that anymore. So, I mean, go I'm ahead. guessing it's something exactly like that. Because I think it's – I'm like, for some reason in my head, it's like, oh, it's the Son of Sam law, but I could be wrong. Yeah. But it's it's a law. Yeah. So, I mean, I am so happy they did that because yeah. her, she would have loved the attention. Oh, yeah. But as of 2006, all of Jill's appeal opportunities had been exhausted and she even legally cannot sell – oh, I said that already. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Um, also shout out to Kim Cantrell, whose research was amazing. I used a lot of her research and she did awesome, like awesome details and stuff. So I used a lot of that for my story, but yeah, that's the insane Jill. Wow. Yeah. It's just been a roller coaster kind of day, huh? I know, seriously. (laughs) Well, thank you so much for listening, everyone. Um, please. So. We want to do once a month, I would love to do a listener's episode where I read your scary stories, your run-ins with true crime, anything. So if you have any of those stories, please, please send it to us at a scary state podcast at gmail.com. Also, please follow us on Instagram. It's a scary state podcast. That's our handle. And um, is that handle? Yeah. So. And then we post um, every Wednesday once an episode airs, we post photos from the episode so that you can, you know, put a face to what we're talking about. So it's pretty cool. And please rate and review us on iTunes. We're on Apple Podcasts um, as of a month or so ago, which was the hardest thing to do. So please rate and review us on there. It would mean so, so much to us. Um, you have anything else to say? Just to stay scary. Stay safe. <laughs> 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 <laughs>